to the NFL a year after Hurricane Katrina in New Orleans is still struggling to prove to itself and everyone else that a city can rebuild and reinvent itself. And so is their new quarterback. Let me take you to New Orleans. He's the biggest free agent signing in New Orleans Saints history. 27-year-old Drew Brees, a quarterback who thought he would spend his entire career with the San Diego Chargers. In San Diego, Drew Brees always had a fight for respect. He was a second round draft choice whom the Chargers wanted to replace in 2004 with first round pick Philip Rivers. But Drew Brees' performance kept Rivers on the bench. He passed for 27 touchdowns in 2004. He led the Chargers to the playoffs and was named the NFL Comeback Player of the Year. He loved being able to show Chargers management that he should be the quarterback. There's definitely satisfaction in proving people wrong, and you know, especially when they bring a guy in, fourth pick of the draft, inevitably to you know, push you aside and, and get in, and, and get in there and, and take your spot. Um, but I, you know, like I said, I, I had these expectations, I had these goals way before he ever got there or anybody ever got there, and I knew that things were going to happen, and when they did. You know, people came to me like, wow, can you believe this is happening? And I say, yeah, sure. I, I, I willed this to happen. I knew this was going to happen. I, I go, you should have you listened to me. I told you not to draft the guy. <laughs> Last season, Breeze was selected to play in his second Pro Bowl, but he never made it to Hawaii. For this, the final game of the year, Gerald Warren of the Broncos falls on Breeze's right throwing shoulder. He suffers a torn labrum and rotator cuff. He wanted to remain in San Diego, but with the injury, he knew his Chargers career was over. In my mind, I went from spending my entire career in San Diego to all of a sudden I get hurt and trust, I mean, I knew that it was serious the minute that it happened. And all of a sudden I, I just kind of went, oh my God, this might be the last time I put on a Charger uniform. We all knew how serious the injury was, and people telling, telling me that, hey, there's guys that, you know, have not come back from this. There's guys that have had to hang it up. And, you know, just the thought of your career ending on one play when you just had such this bright future and these expectations and these goals, I mean, it is scary. The Superdome in New Orleans, the new home of Drew Brees, the home of the Saints, all trying to rebuild in the aftermath of Katrina. The Saints have given Breeze a six-year, $60 million contract. His comeback has been most impressive. He wants to be the focal point of the revival of the New Orleans Saints. I just feel like this is just the perfect time in my career to, to kind of make a change and to be a part of something really special here, which I think, you know, we're not only are we re rebuilding a foundation for, for our team, but we're also, you know, part of rebuilding a community. And, and, and what we can do, I think, as a football team and as players for that community, just by, you know, going out and representing ourselves the right way and winning football games, I mean, uplifting the spirits of an entire region, I think that this is, it's really an interesting situation to be in, but, but I think an opportunity that we're all going to really take advantage of. Last December, a shoulder injury ended Drew Brees' career in San Diego. Now he's reborn with the New Orleans Saints, where the fans hope that Drew Brees can help the Saints and the city find a bright new future. Our Pillows kind of, you know, taped the, the shirt around him so he would stay. He looked like the, from the Ghostbusters, the Stay Puft Marshmallow Man. That's what he looked like, you know, just kind of waddling around right there. I didn't mind doing it at the time, uh, you know, and so this is part of, part, of, part of being a kid and growing up. You wouldn't do it again. I wouldn't do it right now. This afternoon. <laughs> oh, <I'd be> <laughs> Maybe. Dude, you've lost a lot. I think you've lost a little steam since then also. Yeah, there we go. It's <laughs> starting early. Yeah. father was a local hero, remarkable for his gutsy style, the saving grace of the otherwise hapless New Orleans Saints. Hey, who's your favorite football player then? My dad. Your dad's your favorite football player too? He was remarkable too as a father, because he'd decide the last thing his sons needed was another coach. Even though he knew more about football than 
than our, our coaches did. He never got involved. He sat at the top of the stands. He, you know, he filmed us. He, he filmed every high school game we had. You know, so he wasn't yelling anything. He was just, he was just up there like any other day. And so he was a spectator, but also careful not to miss a moment. A commitment born out of his own personal loss. You got about as tough a deal as a young man as anybody could have with what happened to your father. He committed suicide. You were the first one to find him. I lost him at a young age, and I think somehow that motivated me when I did have children. Um, I, I really wanted to be with them. As I got older, you know, 16, 17, I realized that my dad, even at that point, wanted to hug us even longer and, and be around, you know, wanting to talk to us. And, and I, and I kind of started to understand that that was the age when my dad lost his father. There might have been three Manning sons in pro football. The oldest, Cooper, was an all-state wide receiver. In 1991, in a golden year for the family Manning, Cooper, a senior, was the favorite target of the new sophomore quarterback, his brother Peyton. It was kind of fun that all that time in the front yard winging around got to come to fruition and really count. We had our own signals. We had it here out in the backyard, you know, slant and, you know, the hook and just our own little, you know, kind of dirt play signals that just he and I kept. People have asked me about your fun years in, in football. I've been around football a long time, but that was the most fun. Cooper was recruited to play at the University of Mississippi, his dad's alma mater. But suddenly his body was failing him, catching a pass once so natural, now strangely problematic. He was diagnosed with a dangerous degenerative spinal condition. Football was over. He would have caught a pass one day to upset Alabama or somebody. I know that. And he would have played, he would have contributed, and he'd have been a good good teammate. So to tell I have to tell him that was all over. That was um, that was pretty tough. They kind of lost a little bit of watching to get to see me play. And the idea of Peyton up teaming up again possibly. And so I kind of felt that uh, we all lost a little bit where it wasn't just all bared on little old me. He kind of wrote me this note saying he knew that his football career was now over with, but he wanted to live his dream of playing football through me. And since that day, Chris, I still treat every practice, every workout, every you know weightlifting session in the month of April as if it could be my last because, because you just don't know. If Cooper was the best athlete, the youngest, Eli, seemed the least likely to succeed. It's like four o'clock in the afternoon. I'm in the I'm in the training room, kind of getting taped. You know, it's just getting get, 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 get ready for the game. Yeah. He calls about 5:30. Well, you know, you got a seven o'clock kickoff, and your child calls at 5:30. I'm thinking something's wrong. What's wrong? What's wrong? You know, anything? I go, Will you tape Seinfeld for me? Because I'm gonna, I'm at to miss it tonight. Can you tape the game? Arch was not happy. That's <laughs> not, that's not the focus he taught us. But in this family, life's lessons are passed on. A father who knew to be a friend, not a coach. A brother who taught another to seize the day. And from Peyton to Eli, an example of what comes of tenacity and devotion. Who's got something good for him? Hard work. Hard work? I love it. You got it. All three. Hard work on three. One, two, three. Hard work! Got it, man. July 4th. I played golf that morning, but I told myself I was going to give my day off from working out. I just you know, go out on the water and hang out. And I called him and I said, what are, you, what are you doing? He said, I just got through working out. I'm going, and quarterback from your Giants are working out. Now I got to go work out. Our kids have just given us so much joy. And it's not about touchdown passes or winning some game, just, just joy, you know, that they've been good kids and uh, that we've been through a lot of things together and that we are a family. It's a great family. It really yeah. is from top to bottom. But you have to remember that Peyton's five years older than Eli, so it wasn't like they grew up com truly competing against each other because of the age difference. And there was one time that Eli came home from college, you know, all grown up, he was a man now, so the boys decided like they usually do, they're gonna go out and play some basketball. 
and that game ended with Eli slam dunking for the win over Peyton. So that one has not been forgotten and will carry over until tomorrow night. Well, Chris, well, you, you got to understand one thing. I was a little brother, four years younger than my brother, and I wanted to beat him really bad. And I know Eli wants to beat his big brother really bad. I'm really concerned about that because the last time Eli was in a big game, he really struggled in the playoffs. So I hope he can take it easy and let the game come to him. I think the edge has got to go to Peyton because he's been in these situations before. He has been prepared going through those big games with New England and so on.